Okay, this is an introduction to Luke 21, and it's on a smaller screen. Later videos, I will put it on a larger screen because right now this is the one available to me, the machine. And I really want you to focus on the numbers here. Because one of the salient features in Luke, especially in Luke, is that he builds his entire gospel around meter. Okay? So in every chapter, the meter that's used is probably going to be important, more important maybe than other books even. Um, he builds his, the entire order of his gospel is built around the meter in the Magnificat. And I did videos in Vimeo, the Luke Meter channel, run the words together, um, showing you how you can prove that Luke's actual outline, the order of the points that he produces, like why does he say Elizabeth was 84? The, the, not Elizabeth, the, the other lady, the, you know, the one who'd been, you know, widowed for so long after Simeon's speech. Why does he mention that she was 84? Okay? Why is that important? Because it has to do with Mary's meter. All of his gospel is built around that meter in the Magnificat. And the, um, Paul in the, the Mary Magnificat meter uh, videos in Vimeo, I showed her meter and all that stuff is, you know, turned into PDFs. I just pasted the text from Bible Works, put it in PDF format, and did the syllable counting that you can see here so that you can understand why Luke is ordering his points the way he's ordering them. Now, before I get into this particular chapter, which is extremely easy to, to see, okay, it's very, the metering is very pointed, like 217 is the ending meter that Mary used. So he's playing on his own recording of the Magnificat, which everybody had known since 5 BC. Um, in order to get through this, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, that will help you when you go to do this yourself because you can count the syllables yourself and get the numbers. See, this is 17 syllables. You can count the syllables. Kai, Tinon, Legon, Ton, Peri, I'm just saying in a bad American accent. Tu, Hieru, Hoti, Litois, Kalois. Okay, that's 17 syllables. You can count that yourself in any passage of the Bible. I mean, you know. It's the same concept with the Hebrew. Syllable, vowel, uh, a syllable is a, is a vowel sound and a consonant sound. Then when you get to the next consonant, generally, not always, then that begins a new syllable. It's not hard. They taught five-year-old kids in shul how to do that with Hebrew. And I'm sure they taught five-year-old Greek kids, too. You learned syllables when you were five in your native tongue. That's about the age when they first start teaching you the formalities of language. Okay, so it's not hard. And everybody learned it that way. Okay, but if you want to understand how Luke is using his meter and see how meter is used as a timeline, then this is a really good place to start. If you want to see how Bible uses meter, Luke's portrayal of it here is as clear as I've ever found. And maybe there's a clearer place, you know, as far as the New Testament goes. But this one's really obvious. So that's why we're starting here. The other thing I wanted to say as a preface is that what's always bothered me about Scripture, I mean, since I was little, is like, God, why are these words the words that they are? Okay, because, you know, I don't know about you, and maybe you, you can't admit it, but I will. I start to read these words in English, and I'm asleep in five minutes. I've heard them a thousand times before, and they're too familiar, and it's in English, and it's snoozy, and it's religious. Okay, but first of all, that's not the way the Greek is. You know, the English is, is so vilely mistranslated that I, you know, I only use it because it's my native tongue. But... If you want to know what's really being said here, you need to get into the original, which is what we're looking at. That's the first thing. 
but even in the original. It's like, why are these words the words that they are? Especially with Greek. Because if I took, took legon, legon ton, okay, while they, while some were speaking, tinon means some, okay, kai can mean when, if, because of, then, and, alright, so it depends on the verb and the subject and what went before. Okay, while they were speaking about the temple, Okay, in Greek, I, you don't have to put those words in that order. Okay? You don't. So why are those words those words? Why are they there, not in the next verse? And why are they in that order? Inquiring minds want to know. And that has been my big bugaboo with scripture from the beginning. I'm 62 now. I started getting really interested in it when I was in college. And I'm like, well, you know, what is this? And my mother, used, she's dead now. My mother used to make fun of me because I got so tired of trying to figure it out and it didn't make any sense. So she used to, she teased me about this for decades about how I would close my eyes, open the Bible to a place I didn't know where it was, move my finger around, and then whatever word it landed on, that was God's will. See, there's hope. If you think you're a stupid Christian, there's hope. You can't be as stupid as I was. Okay? And I was, what, 18, 19 when I was doing that? So, see, I can read the Greek now and even parse it in syllables and tell you what this stuff means. So, see, there's hope. Dumbest person ever alive, I wanted to say was me, but that that's hyperbole. Who knows who's the dumbest person alive? But that's pretty bad, don't you think? So, before I get into why these words are in this order, because the meter tells you why. Why it's legon ton peri rather than, you know... Uh, it's a tinon legon ton, okay, it could have been legon ton tinon. Tinon could have been the third word in the sentence, not the second. So why is that so? While you're looking at that and seeing, getting just sort of familiar with the map of the numbers, I gotta go turn some lights on because it's getting dark in here. Okay, break over. So why is this happening? Well, it's clever beyond description. That's why. Okay, the first thing you want to notice is that, that, that this is a dateline. It doesn't have to be a dateline. But he's using it like a dateline, so it's very clever. He's saying that the, the time when Luke 21 occurred was 30 A.D., but he's writing about it 28 years later. And this is the same dateline that James used for the book of James. So he and James, are he's writing his gospel, and Paul's writing Ephesians or publishing it, I think is a more accurate description for Paul. And James is writing the book of James all in the same year and all due to Paul's arrest. So maybe they wrote part of it in an earlier time and they set it aside until God told them more about what he wanted said. And then they composed some other chapters. So I'm beginning to wonder now if each chapter doesn't have its own dateline. Okay, I didn't do the meter that you see. Well, yeah, I did do this one in Luke. Um, so when he's using 28 here, he's saying, Hi, I'm writing this chapter 28 years after Christ died. And when Christ died is when this chapter events actually took place. And how do I know that? Because his second date line, because there's always two of them, is I am also writing you 35 years from the millennium. See, these date lines reach backwards and they reach forwards. And sometimes they only reach backwards and they only reach forward depending on what the date lines are. And that's how come I know how to interpret these. 
See, it's kind of like a fingerprint or like forensic science. When you get enough evidence, here are numbers, then you know how to read them. And then here's our third point. Oh, and by the way, when at the end of the year Christ died, there were 63 years left to the millennium. 63, of course, is the meter that he used when he introduced Luke 1. Because there he's using it to say, hi, hi, um, I'm writing you 63 years after the events I'm describing with Elizabeth and Zacharias. And he's making an equidistant play on 63 here and there. Okay? And Mary used 35 as her date line. So he's reminding you, hi, I'm tracking based on Mary's timeline. This is very funny, because, of course, when Christ is talking here, especially when you get to 217, in the Matthew thing that Luke is, is wrapping his text around, in the Matthew thing here, Christ has a special paragraph at the end of Matthew 24, the very end. There's a special paragraph that's 217 syllables long, which is, if you look at the Mary meter, it was about how initial Hanukkah, you know, presaged the birth of her son. And she's saying it um, sometime in the first or second week of Adar, which you know from Luke 1. Pity the scholars don't know how to read it. It's in Luke 1, 26 and Luke 1, 36. It's a joke about the sixth month because Israel had two calendars. And he's using a civil calendar for Mary. And so in Mary's sixth month, six months from the start of the civil year, Mary gets the news she's going to be pregnant. And she gets it when Elizabeth is in her six months. But Elizabeth belonged to the priestly tribe, so that was using the sacred year. It's very funny in the Greek. Okay, her immediate reaction when she sees Elizabeth is to create a meter that's 217 syllables long, and that's evocative of Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Okay. Where she talks about how Haggai, too, predicted her son would be born on Hanukkah at the last couple of verses and a couple of more prior. So Luke is reminding the reader, hi, you want to look at the Mary thing here? When he uses a 217. But that's not all he's doing. He's giving you a timeline, just like Matthew 24 is a timeline, about how church interest is going to change. Okay? Now that's the big question. Church interest changing. How does it change? Why does it change? And what does it mean to have this kind of timeline about to change? Now, the style of the way the timeline works, as I showed in Matthew 24, it really goes back to Moses. Genesis 1 is a timeline basically explaining to Israel why Israel exists. And he's using the flood. It's a literal set of events. But he's using the flood as his um, timeline. And the first flood, so to speak, that there was, was the waters covering the earth during the restoration, not initial creation, of the earth in Genesis 1, 2, and following. Okay, so that style, which of course the scholars don't yet know, that style in there, it was a timeline of retrospective exposition. Daniel also uses, the same, uses it in the same manner in Daniel 9. Isaiah used it prospectively for Israel's kings. Daniel tags to Isaiah when Daniel's doing his prayer, using it retrospectively with respect to those same kings to show that Isaiah got fulfilled, Isaiah 53. And so Christ, in Matthew 24, did a prospective timeline of the world. Luke is now tagging, in a very interesting manner, that same timeline, but he's separating out the trends the trends of history, and in some cases, major events of future history for church, if the rapture doesn't happen. Remember, God knows all the noble, okay? So he knows what would be the outcome if a thing didn't happen. He would know the outcome if a thing did happen. 
Okay, he knows all the conditions, causes, conditions, successions, and relations, and determines their certain futurition. That's the theological definition of God's decree. Okay? I remember my pastor repeating it time and time again. The idea that, you know, it's up to God whether the future even actually happens. Well, here he's giving you not only the future that happens, but the future that happens if there's no rapture. Okay? So the trends are not necessarily the same for church as they are for the world. So he's layering using the same text, but yet he's, he's doing what's called indirect discourse selecting some of the words and packaging them a little bit differently, expecting you to already know the Matthew timeline. So he can separate out and tell you the, as it were, super timeline that's layered on top of the Matthew timeline, but for church. And it's not pretty, okay? He's writing 28 years after Christ dies. There are 35 years to the millennium. Christ died at the end of the year that Christ died, 63 years prior to the millennium. Okay, so this comes to mean 28 years after the events here. So it also comes to mean from the time Christ dies, that would be the first syllable, the chi, and then 28 years after that, okay, is where the word ipen is, ipen, apen. I should pronounce it eight then. There. Okay, each syllable stands for a year. But when you take the whole sentence in context, it's telling you a trend. A trend of history for the first here, the first 28 years after Christ dies. For church. Okay, and then by the time you get down to the second line, it's 63 years after Christ dies. Trend for church. Then by the time you get down here, and every time you see it turn orange, that's the seven factor. It means it's a real important epic in history at that point. Okay? And then the difference tells you whether it was good or bad. It's like a report card for church. 28 is a good number. It means growth plus some, some difficulty and struggle with the growth occurring either during or at the end. 63 is not good. 63 means that there are a whole bunch of people who are positive, but the vote that was supposed to come in equaling 70 is short. It comes to mean vote short, and what it ends up meaning is the last seven years are going to be tribulation quality. Not the tribulation, but if tribulation-like. Because remember, church wasn't supposed to exist. We got inserted. So God already knew what the trends of history were going to be, and then when Christ agreed to pay for sins of future people, God had to decide, while Christ is on the cross, God decided, obviously he decided in eternity past, but as it were, he makes it official because Christ is now paying in advance for souls not yet born. And the angelic trial is about Satan trying to prevent those souls from either being born or believing in Christ or maturing in Christ. And if Satan can do that, he can prevent the rapture from occurring. And therefore, all of God's promises to Israel, which are on hold temporarily, that's Romans 9 and 10 and 12, okay, 9 through 11, actually, um, then all those promises can't be made, and then therefore Satan would win in the trial. So this is really doable, okay? Vote short. That's why time is contingent. Vote short. Well, then time might end. Obviously, it doesn't because we're looking at this from the past, but if you were living then, you'd have to know, okay, this is going to be a difficult time. Time is short. Not all the votes are in. Satan's trying to convince everybody, you know, to not grow or not vote to believe in God. See, when you believe in the gospel, you're essentially voting for God's solution to the problem. If you don't believe, it's because you don't agree with God's solution to the problem. You might not even agree that God exists. See the difference? And then once you're a believer, you have to decide, well, I want to learn this Bible and learn and live on this Bible because it's God's Word. And most people decide they don't want to do that. They'd rather opt for religion or human works or some other kind of substitute for learning and living on Bible. Okay, so this is recording the history of those choices, the future history. 
because each such choice alters the, we want to call it, composition of church. And if you have a whole lot of people believing but nobody growing, then who's going to be their king? There's got to be at least one person who super matures. That's the condition of time ever since Adam. All right? But if you got a whole bunch of people believing, but you got no head, then you got to develop the head. And if you can't develop the head yet, because there's nobody wanting to be a head, then time continues. But you know what? It's got this deadline. The deadline is 490. And we get real close to that being a problem right down here. 469. Okay? So this is a report card. 126 is a bad number. 126 years is what Isaiah used in Isaiah 53 saying he was writing. 126 years before the, the first temple would go down. And when she would go down, that's the equidistance, she would have 126 years on her 490 year time grant that isn't going to happen. And that's why God says in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, he does it in those pieces seven weeks and then 62 weeks okay the seven the, the the seven weeks is 49 years that's 126 minus 49 and i can't do the calculator here wait a minute let me go get mine okay so it's 126 minus 49 the 49 years that she was um that she didn't observe her sabbath which is why the temple went down that's 77 years, minus 7 for the tribulation, that leaves 70, which was in Daniel 9, too. So when God is talking about those accounting pieces, this is what tipped me off to the whole 490 structure in the first place. When God is talking about those accounting pieces, he is literally finding a way, as it were, to reimburse time for the temple to be reconstructed. It's an accounting that makes for the tribulation. Israel was owed seven more years. And she also ended up being short because she was 49 years short in not observing her Sabbath. And so another seven years are owed on the, on the 49 years. And that's why you have the 62 weeks and Christ was supposed to die at the end of them in 37 AD, which the scholars don't know because they're using lunar years instead of solar. Christ ends up dying instead at the first, at the beginning of the 62nd week. And that's why you have this accounting with the, the seven being debited. Okay? But here, whatever it was that happened here in the vote short, it gets made up. And this, of course, is 70 plus 50. Just like Isaiah had done it in Isaiah 53. Go see my Isaiah 53 channel in Vimeo. I did the videos, I map it out, you can see it live in the video in Isaiah 53's text. It's very, very balanced and clear. Okay, well your total time at the point that this 126 is benchmarked is 189. Now since this is measured from Christ's death, you're looking at 219 AD. You have to add 30 to these numbers to know what AD year it is. So this is 219 AD, and that ties to Paul. Paul, you know, because Luke and Paul were traveling to with each other. All right, so you know, I mean, I can't prove it exactly, but surely they talked with each other about God, what God was giving each one of them to write. And Paul benchmarks 217. Luke benchmarks 219. Now 217 had more significance for the political side, that was Paul's. Um, you know, sort of focus. He his his timeline is about how church influences history. This seems to just be about church. And 219 is more relevant solely for church because that's when the pogrom started in Rome. That Paul was benchmarking at the beginning at 217. 219 it was on full swing because Origen was there to try to con try to get the Severan mothers to convert to Christianity, and because of that. Because of his popularity, the Roman nobles and stuff like that were really mad at the mothers. And they started a pogrom of Christians in Rome at the time. And I want to say it was Callistus who got killed. Hippolytus, who was arguing with Callistus, managed to escape. Um, and I don't know what happened to Julius Africanus. This is where the Pope myth got invented. 
This is when and why. The inventor was a guy named Demetrius of Alexandria. You can find out all that information in a book that a guy wrote for initially for his dissertation, but now it's in its second printing called Pope Lists. You can find it on Amazon. I have the first edition. He's just come out with a second edition. Um, and the guy, the author's name is Robert Lee Williams, and all he does is trace out the church father writings to prove when the bishop's list got structured. And this is the first time in history that Peter is put on a list. He wasn't on the list before. It was invented in order to just, because of some kind of competition with origin in 217 A.D. 219 A.D. is when they had the pogrom, and that's why this is the 126, which is basically saying the church at this point is as bad as Israel so that the temple will go down. He's marking the year, as it were, the church is so bad, it's analogous to temple down. Because in Isaiah's meter, that's exactly what the, one, the first 126 is about. The second 126 in Isaiah's meter is temple rebuilding. So now we have 217 as the next break. 28 means that some growth happened as a result of all that persecution. So you got a 28 here, growth under persecution. Growth and persecution. It's not just growth. Growth would be 21. This is growth and persecution because you got the extra 7. So now he's tying to Mary's meter, basically saying, Hi, what Mary prophesied about Hanukkah being the birth of her son, all those events, it's sort of a parallel. This time in history is a parallel. And it certainly was. The actual date here in, in view uh, is 217 plus 30 equals 247. And this is just before the Decius persecution. The Decius persecution was not really much of a persecution. It was basically that they were so tired of the Christians being such ornery people it, and it was so popular that Decius just had wanted anybody to make a little, get a certificate saying, Hi, I, I'm a, a real Roman patriot, a real Roman citizen, a real Roman, you know, friend. And to show that, I'm going to either, and they made him do some token thing like pour out some wine on the, pay, on the, on the ground. That was their way of honoring the gods. Or you made some token sacrifice, okay? And anybody who wouldn't do that, okay, then he would persecute them. Okay, well, that's kind of what happened with Hanukkah in the, you know, strong, what do you want to call it? That was what Epi, uh, Epi, um, Antiochus IV Epiphanes was trying to do to the temple. Back at original Hanukkah, he tried to turn it into a pig temple. And when the Jews rebelled, he mixed their blood with the pigs in the temple, on the altar. Well, Decius wasn't that bad, but it was still the same idea, okay? Antiochus was trying to Greekify the whole, you know, of Judea, all right, what would, we would later call Judea. He was trying to Greekify it, okay? Well, Decius was trying to Romanify it, all right? And that's why it's really cute because you're going to, he you hear of, amongst the nations, meaning the Goyim, okay? You're going to hear Goyim against Goyim, kingdom against kingdom. Yeah, well, because it's church. But it's, it's like Hanukkah too, only not quite so violent as actually got experienced by the Jews back during Antiochus IV. But it's, a, it's, it's the same idea. So that's 247, and Paul had benchmarked it um, sort of in the middle in Ephesians 1.10. So there's some glancing tracking to Paul, but he's not benchmarking at the exact same syllable. But here's what he is doing, and this is what's amazing, but you see it most clearly here, is he's benchmarking definitely all throughout, he, even in the text you can see it, he's benchmarking to Matthew. Okay. And it's, it gets really, it gets so precise down here when he gets toward the end. Like, this is 469, and it should be, and the Lord benchmarks at 490. So Luke is literally tracking the syllables, because here's 469. I'll explain these other two numbers in a minute. Here's 469, and 20, see, this is 20. It's kind of barely readable. That makes it 499, or 89. 
490 is the end of the the time grant okay but it but Luke if he's playing off a different fiscal year wouldn't be calling it 490 he'd be calling it 489 and since Luke introduces both fiscal years in Luke 1 with respect to Elizabeth and Mary it, I'm not sure which of the two fiscals he's got in mind, the autumnal equinox or the vernal equinox. I'm thinking autumnal, but he might have switched to vernal because they do switch their fiscal years in their countings. That's why you might be plus one or minus one at some point. It depends on the fiscal year they're using. Okay, so this he's, he see th this is a clause. You always parse these things by clause, otherwise you're going to miss the wit. So this is 489, whereas in the Lord's parsing of the clauses, okay, and he's talking about the same thing, he parses it at 490. So sometimes Luke takes sentences that the Lord said later on and he sticks them up higher here. Obviously because he wants to get these timeline results for church. But he's definitely tracking what the Lord is saying at the same syllable count every once in a while so then the question is you know why did he do it that way and then you have to get into the specifics of what the history was and then you'll see the satire like why is he using Uranu there from heaven Apuranu why well it's got some satirical play on you know the time okay and you're gonna have to go through your own history you know, Google and your history books and whatever's in your library and find out what's the, the satire, because it will be satirical, because the rapture isn't happening. It's supposed to, but it doesn't. It's late. Why is it late? That's what everybody said first century. They got jaded really fast after Christ died, really, really fast. That's why this is the 63. They believed, and then they stopped. Okay, so 126, it's so bad. Negative evolution of the Bible is so bad, it's like the temple down. And that's in the year 219 close, you know, for the period ending 219 A.D., which is when Origen was trying to convert the Severan wives. And Origen was a dingbat. He wouldn't know the Bible if it bit him. All the church fathers are dingbats. Okay, and it doesn't get better. They start eating each other alive during this period in 247. They start having all these councils. Well, did you offer anything to Decius so that you wouldn't get persecuted by Decius? You know, with the donatists. Oh, well, you did, so we're not going to forgive you. You don't belong to our section. That was really good because you don't want to belong to those apostates. But they thought they were right and everybody else was a heretic. And this is the time of Irenaeus and Tertullian and all those other jerks. They were jerks. If you read them, you need Pepto-Bismol just to get through the first chapter. It's like listening to Donald Trump for more than five minutes. Okay? That's how bad they are. All right, so by here, it's not good. This is 126. In Isaiah 53... He counts 126 syllables from Isaiah 53, 1. And the actual chapter didn't begin in Isaiah 53, 1. It began 77 syllables prior in Isaiah uh, 52, 13. The first 77 syllables were about David's life because David died at age 77. And the theme of Isaiah 53 is first David's birth to last David's death. And it's got ellipses. It's really sophisticated. But the point is, is that if you were to add 77 to 126, remember I told you the components? Now you add one of them, that's 203. So 77 more plus 126 is 203, and that's at the 420 mark, which is 450 A.D. Notice the 33. This is hysterical. 450 A.D., what was that? If you pay a little bit of attention to history, you'll find out, oh, in 450 A.D., that's 13 years after Constantine died. And what did Constantine's sons all do almost the second he died? They killed each other. 
they killed each other and they killed and tried to kill everybody else over what? Well, over the succession of the empire. There were three sons. And they killed everybody they didn't like, who they accused of being a heretic, because all their battles, it was a whole civil war that took place all over the Roman world. They killed each other over whether God was one or three. And they were already fighting about that for a long time in the Hippodrome, which is where they had their sports. And they had the green team and the blue team, and I forget which of the two, was saying, well, Jesus is really not a man, or Jesus really is a man, or Trinity is false, or, you know, it's God is really only one person. And they killed each other over this. The brothers killed each other. This was civil war, cannibalism of Christians by Christians, and everybody confiscating each other's scripture, of course. Okay? That's in 420. So Isaiah syllable 203 was the actual syllable, cumulative syllable in Isaiah 53 for the temple being down. The text in Isaiah 53 is, God violated. You won't see it translated that way because it's a sexual connotation and the, the translators won't say, okay, what it is. That's the syllable for 586 B.C. when the first temple actually goes down. The distance from Isaiah 53, 1 is 126. But once you did the 126 years, you got to 203 because Isaiah had 77 syllables fronting. So he's telling you, Luke's telling you, hi, remember Isaiah 53 when the temple went down? This is how bad it is. And, and Constantine's temple then goes down, too, because all of his sons basically kill each other. Constans dies, and I think Constantius is left, and then he kills his other brother, and Constantius, too, is the last guy standing in 461. But all that's in the middle. He, he's benchmarking it in the middle of the war. Why? Because of the text so that you will know to get out of the Roman Empire. If you're in it during the time, from see here's 387, which is approximately, uh, what, 387 and 30, which would be 417, right? 387 plus 30, 417. So round about 417, you're going to start looking ahead if you're using your syllable counts as a timeline like you're supposed to. And you're going to say, oh, I don't think I want this. Para do te seste, te cae opo, opo, gone, gone on. Cae delfo, cae su ge, su ge, ge non, cae feel. Oh, everybody's going to hate each other. And deliver them over to death. I think I'm going to get out of the Roman Empire before 417 A.D. Yeah, be a good idea. Because that, well, everything the text is saying here, literally the brothers, okay? See, Adelphon, brothers, ha ha. This is when the Constantine's kids are all killing all of their male rivals and killing everybody else who doesn't agree with them and each other. The last one standing I want to say was Constantius II by 461, which is just after this, 11 syllables more after this. Okay? And notice, he dies before diatonomamu. Uh-oh. Then he didn't die in Christ's name. This is how biting the text can be. The leaders didn't do their job. You all are fighting in my name, but you're not in my name. But they were fighting because of his name. You see the satire element in this? It's just unbelievable. And of course, by the time you get to 437, you add 30 to that, and that's 467, which is about seven years after Constant, I want to say it was Constantius, died. Yeah, but he wasn't quite really in my name. He was just fighting in my name. But it was really in his own name he was fighting. And in his own definition of me, he had nothing to do with me. 
See how biting the satire is? See how relevant it becomes to know that this is the timeline? Same kind of wit that I did with the Paul videos five years ago. Maybe it wasn't quite five years ago when I finished the videos, but I, I learned all of this in Paul in 2010, December of 2010, and my life has not been the same since. Okay, then continuing on, we got 469. Oops, crisis. What does 49 mean? All these di all these numbers are in the Old Testament. They all have doctrinal meanings. Okay, 49 is the number of years from Rehoboam until the temple goes down. See how we're staying on the same theme of the temple? Just like here, it was talking about, Oh, Lito, is Carlo, is oh, yeah, Tuyero. Oh, yeah, we got all these beautiful stones. Yeah, and they ain't going to be but demolished. Yeah, and now he's telling you about the demolishing of church. Which is taking rather longer. Oh, church is still in the toilet, baby. 49 years, she gets destroyed. We're using all these really bad numbers in Isaiah. And, of course, this is Daniel now. 49 years, Ralph Baum, until Temple goes down. She didn't observe any sabbatical years. And there's seven more years old on those sabbatical years, which is why the other prominent Bible number is 56. <gasps> Uh-oh. And it's 469 years after he died. So we've only got, what, 21 years left before the end of time. And this is our report card. Diaspora? Not good. So that's why benchmarking the clauses is so important. Because then you see these hidden wit. The hidden wit. Yerushalayim. At 489 after his death is 520 A.D. Yeah, and in Yerushalayim in 520 A.D. That's when some ding-dong, whose name was Elias, had started building, starting around 494 or so, started building an abomination of desolation around the rock. Something they call the Church of St. Mary, or Nea Ecclesia, or Nea Theotokos. Theotokos. Mary, Mother of God. Above the rock that signifies Christ? Mary is above Christ? You're building a church to Mary instead of to Christ? Excuse me? Yeah. Now you see why time should have been ending. But, it's 49, and during the 49, what do we know from the Old Testament comparison and use of that number to tell us the doctrinal meaning? Well, we know that Daniel was going during the 49, that's when he prayed. He prayed in the 49th year. That's when Daniel 9 took place. <coughs> that's this 49 is Daniel's own date line that he used as like bookends for his prayer. And then there was Jeremiah, and there was Ezekiel. So there were some few. Proel picotas. First fruits. Handfuls of wheat you wave before the Lord. 49, you get the pun. On the four, on this, you could count seven weeks from the from this, um, last day of Passover. Jews think it's the first day. It's really the last day. On the last day of Passover, per Numbers 28, 26. And you count 49 days from that, and the 50th day is Pentecost. So we're almost ready to harvest. But it's not a happy time. So that last period that really ends right here is kind of significant in history. 520 A.D. And what is it talking about? When you see the abomination in Jerusalem. Yeah. And that's when you did see it. It was half finished. Elias started it and then he didn't finish it because he ran out of money. And then Justinian's going to come in seven years later. Tote, note, hoti, in. 
and start rebuilding it. Right there, about 527 is when um, Justinian comes in and he wants to rebuild, you know, finish the building of that abominating church. Can you see the, the wit? Can you see how this references church? And it goes all the way on from there, which I'll cover more in my next increment. I need a break now.